So fast forward to the present where new forms of openness are uh, developing and new tools for access and analysis as well as new means and channels for sharing, for distribution, and for the integration of information with action are, are, are now uh, developing. That's why we sponsored this event and collaborated with the School of Library, Archival, and Information Studies, a great partner close at hand, uh, to make this event possible. I, I'd like to specifically thank Mary Sue Stevenson from SLACE, who unfortunately can't be here in person, but will be watching the webcast. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, and thank Carolyn Hayhorn-Quake, the school's director, who's in the audience today. And I'd like to thank Alan Cho, who is a librarian in our program services unit, who worked with me in planning this, this event. So on to the introductions of the main event. Our speakers today are Jonathan Kift and Josh Rose. Currently, Jonathan is working on his MLIS degree at SLACE. He's also working as a student librarian for UBC. Library Assessment Office, and as a digitization assistant in UBC's Digital Initiatives Program. Previously, he held a co-op position in our library's web development team, and before SLACE and UBC, Jonathan worked as a software developer for 10 years. Josh recently graduated, in fact, this April from SLACE with an MLIS degree. This past year, he worked as a graduate academic assistant in the UBC Library Assessment Office and as a student librarian at Vancouver Public Library. Prior to that, he worked at Queen's University's Humanities and Social Sciences Library. His undergraduate degree is in journalism from the University of Oregon. Josh and Jonathan will be presenting on their experiences at the recent master class on open data sponsored, by, sponsored and promoted by the Thai Yi News Organization. They will present an overview of this class. They will address what open data is, and how it can be found, processed, analyzed, and used to tell stories that are meaningful to people's lives. They will describe some data visualization techniques, and because they were each part of different working groups during the two-day class, they will also share a bit about those group projects and the outcomes. So Josh and Jonathan, Jonathan over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so thank you for the uh, introduction, Gordon, and uh, I also would like to thank Alan and Gordon and, uh, and Mary Sue for helping get this thing all off the ground. And uh, yeah, I'd like to again thank you all for coming out here on a Friday afternoon in the middle of summer that actually seems like we had a bit of sun today and you're actually sitting inside, so it's very much appreciated. So um, as Gordon was saying, uh, we were part of what's called the Thai Master Classes. Um, they have done seven of these. It's sort of a, an experimental pilot project that they've been running, typically around 16 people per class, so fairly small, fairly uh, intense uh, interaction with, with uh, various instructors. Um, Thai has been, uh, been making their, a name for themselves as an independent online magazine and news source. And uh, they've been doing a lot of informative stories. And so this is an interesting chance to get uh, one of their uh, main, well, their web strategy development design consultant by the name of Philip Smith to come and share his, his ideas, his thoughts, things that he's discovered. And so what we're going to attempt to do is compress two intensive uh, days into one, well, about 40 minutes. Um, what that means is that although we spend a lot of time doing uh, not just presentation, like not just him teaching to us, but showing us, walking us through things, as well as us sitting down and working on our own projects. Today we're just going to do more of a checklist of the types of things that we worked on. So you can see we had a lot of different types of people here. It was a primarily journalistic focus, but we also had um, uh, counselors, nonprofit workers, we had a couple of environmental scientists, and of course a couple of library students as well. So I'm just showing a, little, a few little slides here of what, what it was like in, this, uh, in the, uh, the very fancy Thai uh, newsroom. So what we'll do is we'll take some time to discuss the actual individual projects that Josh and I worked on in a little while. But first of all, uh, Josh is going to be here to talk about what open data itself is. So thank you. Over to you. 
Hello, thank you. So open data is a philosophy and practice which seeks to make different forms of data available to the public without restrictions. So no restrictions from copyright, from patents, or other mechanisms of control. And it seeks to make data available for free and importantly in a machine readable format so it can be manipulated and used for other purposes. The open data movement is related to other open trends like open access, open source, and open government. As more data is created and collected, open data allows for sharing, reusing, and combining data, making it more valuable to a greater number of people. During the class, most of our focus was on finding and using data to tell a story, particularly open government data. So here's one example, a recent example, of what news organizations like the Globe and Mail are doing with data to tell a story. This interactive graphic, which isn't interactive here, but when you're sitting in front of a computer, was uh, used for, was published on April 20th this year alongside a news article, Local Schools at Risk as Parents, Students Race to the Hottest Classes. So the story uses data from the Vancouver School Board overlaid onto a map of Vancouver with its high schools and their surrounding catchment areas. According to the article, BC law allows families to choose which high school to send their kids. So what the story describes is a shifting imbalance where certain high schools on the west side of Vancouver are over capacity while other school high schools, particularly on the east side, are under capacity and at risk of closing. So this interactive graphic accompanying the story allows the reader to view which high schools are over capacity and under capacity and to click on one catchment area to see where in Vancouver that school is drawing its students from. According to Amanda Cox, the graphics editor at the New York Times, there are four ways that data can drive a story. Data is good at revealing patterns. It's good at providing context to give a story more weight or depth or color than it had before. Data is good at describing geography. It can provide a context to a place or it can map disparity. And data is good for comparing scales. Many news organizations are using open data to tell stories. One organization that is doing really interesting data journalism is The Guardian newspaper in the UK with their data blog. Frequently they publish stories based on open data and they almost always include the data they're using in a Google spreadsheet within the story. Not only is the data they use available for reuse, but the tools news organizations use to obtain, clean, and visualize data are now freely available to anyone. So today we are going to talk about some of these tools that we learned about during the master class. Uh, during our class, Philip Smith talked about several approaches he uses to find publicly available data. The number of local, regional, and national open government data portals is growing here in Canada and around the world. Vancouver, Nanaimo, Surrey, North Vancouver District, Edmonton, Toronto, and several other cities have websites with open government data. There is also one for BC, Data BC, and an open data pilot project for Canada. Still, a lot of publicly available government data cannot be found through open data sites yet, but, most, but must be requested from the institution that collects it. For example, fire incident reports need to be requested from the Vancouver Fire Department. I'm happy to report that number two on Philip's list of approaches for finding data was to ask a reference librarian. And I think it speaks to the skills of librarians and it's certainly true at UBC Library where Mary Luby and Tom Burtnacker and the data services team know about finding data sets and GIS data and open data. So Jonathan's now going to talk a little bit more about the tools that are available for finding data. 
I know we're mentioning a lot of links and things, but don't get overwhelmed. We actually have put together a wiki page that we'll have a URL to at the end. So if you're curious about where to find all these tools and things online, we've, we've got that covered. So yes, tools and technology. So we we broke them down to three major categories of finding and obtaining data, uh, cleaning up your data to make it usable, and then presenting and visualizing data. So I'm gonna take this uh, first section. So actually you'll find that we were, are, we're gonna be discussing Google tools a lot. Um, now I know not everybody uses Google and there's some concerns about having everything controlled by a particular corporation. But uh, the, the lessons that we learned and the stuff we learned was came from a very pragmatic perspective of journalists who uh, need to do things quickly, they wanna be collaborative, and most importantly, a lot of the stuff is going to end up on the web. And so starting on the web actually makes that workflow a lot simpler. And so a lot of the tools that, that Philip talked to us about are actually Google tools. The first one is one that I think a lot of you probably are familiar with. It's called Google Site Operator. Basically, if you've tracked down a site that contains data that you're interested in or you think it does, you can use the site operator to search, limit your search to just that website. So in this case, if you ever wanted to use Google to search for Google on Google.com, you could do that and you get that result right there. Maybe not terribly useful, but, uh, but I kind of liked it. So that one is pretty simple. The next one is one that fewer people know about, which I found quite helpful, which is the file type operator. Um, a lot of times you need to be aware not just of the content of the data you're looking for, but also the format that it comes in. Um, we have been talking about open data, but a lot of what we're talking about here is also what's called data mining, which is when you're looking for data that is public, but may not have been made open in the sort of machine usable format that we've been talking about. So sometimes you'll be needing to sort of dig around for files that are in all kinds of formats that may or may not be exactly what you need. So a good one to be looking for, of course, is spreadsheet files. Those ones tend to be really easy to work with right off the top. So if you're looking for files that end in XLS or CSV, or which is, stands for comma separated value files, those tend to be really good data containers and will hopefully have the kind of things you're looking for. If you're looking for uh, geographic data, then uh, SHP or shape files or KML files, which are what Google Maps and Google Earth use, are also very good uh, potentials, places to look for. Um, and again, these, the shape files especially can take a little bit of work and we're not gonna get into too much of the detail with those but we do have people like Tom Brittnacker who's a, who's a whiz with that kind of thing and can help you out with that type of thing. Um, databases, again, you may find various, uh, various database files that you can, uh, you can manipulate to, uh, to get the data that you need. And lastly, documents that aren't your typical HTML can also be all over the place on a, on a website. Uh, partic particularly, you'll find a lot of reports that are produced in PDF format they may have tables in them of, of data that could be very useful, but PDFs are not the easiest things to work with in terms of data. But Josh will show you a couple of tips on how to, uh, uh, how to pull some of the data out of those. Uh, another thing, going into Google spreadsheets. Google, so Google has a suite of uh, Office apps, and the most important one for working with data is Google Spreadsheets. And uh, just like Excel or similar spreadsheet programs, you can put functions into, into individual cells. And one that's very handy and, and nice for a web-based tool is the import HTML function. What that lets you do is you can go to any, you can point it at any site and you can get it to pull any HTML style table and turn it from something that looks like that. This is taken from our actual wiki and it just inserts it straight into a table. And this is live, so if that table got updated, this, this data would, would uh, update automatically without you having to do anything. So you can use this data directly and manipulate it and uh, work with it right there. Now, say you're trying to extract some, some somewhat more recalcitrant data from a website. Um, there is this fantastic tool that was brand new to me, which is called scraperwiki.com. Uh, what it lets you do um, is, well, basically the idea is you may be looking for, you found a site, it has data, but you don't know what to do with it. There's a chance, if it's a prominent website, that somebody else has had that same idea. If they have and they're computer savvy, they may have put a scraper up on ScraperWiki for you to use. Um, 
And not only that, if they haven't, uh, the, as it says there, you can actually, for a fee, you can pay the people at Scraper Wiki to uh, go ahead and, uh, and uh, write a scraper for you. Not only that, of course, is that if you feel like you have um, a tendency or you want to try out some PHP or Perl or Ruby or some of these scripting languages, it actually has a built-in uh, editing uh, suite that you can use to create your own scrapers directly on the site. And so, for example, we did a search and we found a, a log of Canadian lobbyist information where you can track down um, which government officials have been contacted by which lobbyists. And this is all data that's available on the website, but it's not in a very usable form. So this scraper can come in very handy for that kind of research. Now, lastly, for the, for the gathering data portion that I want to talk about, um, is sometimes you need to gather data for yourself. Now, we use a lot of, uh, there are a lot of different potential survey tools that are out there. And I know, especially, again, there are, there are concerns about hosting that kind of information uh, on a site like Google, which is not in Canada. Uh, but depending on the type of data, and if it's, if it's not uh, terribly sort of critical data, it's more informal data, especially if you're, if you're trying to help students who, who want to use something that's part of their workflow already, and chances are they're probably already using Google. Uh, Google Forms is a great way to sort of pick up uh, and gather information from people. Um, the thing that makes it really nice is that you can set up the forms fairly easily, but again, like, like with, the, with the import HTML function, it, you get live data directly into a Google spreadsheet, which you can then immediately visualize and analyze. Okay, so next we're going to move on to cleaning data. Great. Thanks. So we've talked a little bit about how you can find your data and how you can collect it. I'll also mention a few tools for formatting and cleaning your data once you have it. Rarely are the data files you get perfect and ready to be processed or presented right away. Getting your data into a state where you can work with it can be a laborious and sometimes tedious process, particularly if you're working with a large data set. That said, the time spent cleaning up your data is usually time well spent because not only will you have a greater confidence in the accuracy of your data, taking a close look at your data will also pay dividends down the road as you uh, try to make sense of it. So there are a couple of tools in particular I'll talk about for dealing with data when it's in an unwieldy format or is messy. One common problem is that the data table you need is only in PDF format. This happens a lot, and according to Philip, it's particularly prominent with data from Canadian data portals. Uh, for example, one of our classmates in the TAI class was looking for data about the number and type of 911 calls made to single room occupancy hotels in the downtown east side. So she found this report that was perfect, and she needed the table from it, but it was in a PDF file, which means when she tried to copy and paste that data into a spreadsheet, it lost all its structure and the text just collapsed into a single column. So depending on how big your data set is, this could either be a minor nuisance or an uh, intractable problem. There are a number of approaches you can take when this happens. One is to extract the tables from the PDF file. And Philip discussed a tool for doing that. Uh, it's called XPDF. And it's an open source viewer for PDF files that runs on Mac. And it includes a function for pulling the text while simultaneously preserving its formatting to create a new text file. And once you have the new text file with the formatting, you can then go in and take out the specific table you're looking for, put that in a new text file, upload that to an Excel file, and with minor, minimal cleanup, it's ready to go and in a form you can use. So that's XPDF. Yeah. Could you please just repeat the process you were talking to last time? You just said after you opened up XPDF to do that? Yeah, so um, XPDF runs on the, the command line. So when you uh, download the, the tool, you can go into like a terminal application or something and just type in um, 
text to PDF, all one word, dash um, format, and then the file that you're looking for, and it will just create a new, the file path that you're looking for, and it will just create a new um, document, text document of the PDF. We'll have, a, we'll have a links to some, to the sites where they have documentation and that kind of thing on the wiki as well, so. So another issue that comes up frequently uh, when you're cleaning, comes up frequently is cleaning your data once you have it in a format you can work with. Errors, inaccurate values, or different conventions for entering the data often happen with large data sets pulled from different sources or collected by different people. Left alone, it can mean that the data should be, that data that should be grouped together remains separate, which throws off the results. Uh, one tool that we learned about in the class aims to help with the process of cleaning up large data sets. Uh, it's called Google Refine. It's a desktop application that you download, install, and run on your computer. And it's basically like a Microsoft Excel on steroids. And it runs as a small web server on your computer, and it's operated from within the web browser. So this means it's very fast and can handle really large data sets that a Google spreadsheet or Excel might bulk at or be slow with. And there are a couple of features I'll mention that I think make Google Refine particularly useful. So one is facets. Um, if you have a large data set, you can quickly produce a list that sits outside of your spreadsheet that contains all of the categories in a selected column. So the example we have here is from the WikiLeaks data dump of the Afghan war logs. And so you have a list, you know, this is a 77,000 row file that has different types of enemy actions. And so the facets quickly, when you select the column where this is, um, this data resides, it will quickly, quickly compile a list of all the different uh, categories that are in that uh, column and then produce, you know, a, right next to it, the number of instances of that. So you don't have to search, you don't have to filter, you don't have to do anything. It's just one tab, drop down tab from the top of the column. And so you can then click on one of the specific uh, categories that you want to look closely at and it, the spreadsheet will change just to present those specific instances. But then the facets, the list of the categories remains outside your spreadsheet so you can move quickly back and forth and look at, look at your data without having to scan through tons of rows. Cluster and merge is another feature I think is really useful. This is a function in which Google Refine scans a column and then presents a list of similar categories which it thinks might actually be the same thing. So in effect, it lets you create a controlled vocabulary for the data by letting you merge the names of categories that you know to be the same using a single controlled term. So for example, a name like Richard Smith, Rich Smith, and Smith Richard in a lobbyist database might actually be the same person. So Google Refine will compile uh, a cluster of these names and it'll give you the option to look at them and decide if you want to merge them into one, uh, one person, depending on what you think is appropriate. And this brings us to another uh, fine feature of Google Refine, which is once you uh, have done these edits, or actions that you performed on a file, you can revert back to an earlier version and it lets you extract also the actions so that if you're working with similar data sets year over year, you can extract and apply the same actions you performed on one data set to the other without having to go through the steps all again. So all in all, a really powerful tool for viewing and cleaning up large data sets. Uh, Jonathan will now talk about his tools for presenting data. Yeah, and just so you know, we're, we're covering a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, if we had if we'd had two days like we had, then we'd be able to sort of walk through these tools and actually sort of show you, show you how they're done, how they're used. 
Um, but that being said, like we're going to have the wiki page, which we're going to try to continually update. And we obviously, if you have questions, we'll have some time afterwards and we'll be around if you ever want to send us an email or ask us for more details on some of these tools. Okay. So, presenting data. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about the fine art of visualization. Uh, and not only that, but what uh, is called visual analytics, where it's not just about the final product, but it's about uh, using visualization as a tool for yourself to analyze data and see what patterns come out of it and uh, try to use that. These are not going to be sort of the final, uh, the final version of visualizations. This is going to be some sort of quick and dirty, uh, rough ways of getting some visualization uh, tools that then you can hopefully uh, refine later on. So one that I thought was just really cool because of how absolutely simple it was to do is called the sparkline function in Google Spreadsheets. So for example, in this, uh, in this spreadsheet, you can see the rightmost column is, uh, has all these little graphs. Now they're not, they don't have labeled axes, they're not about making very accurate representations, but what they let you do is get you a very quick view of how various pieces of data compare with one another. So you can see where certain data sets will dip at the same time um, and see whether they, they trend in the same direction and that kind of thing. And this was as simple as filling in a, a sparkline command into the top row and, and just dragging down and it would just automatically fill it in. Uh, and it's a great way of uh, getting a very quick overview of uh, what a data set contains without very much effort at all. Uh, next one that's very simple that we tend to maybe overlook is just something called conditional formatting. Um, any any uh, spreadsheet program has this, which basically this lets you change the uh, format of a cell based on the data that's contained within it. So in this case, you get a nice highlight of, uh, of who came in first in this particular uh, uh, race, political race. And if you have a large data set, you can make it so that data that has a certain value stands out quickly. So you can you can see it at a glance. And this is also very useful if you are required to um, show your data, which in, in general we should always be trying to make sure that the data that we're presenting, even if we're visualizing it, making it nice and pretty, that the data itself is still accessible to the, to the end user. If we do some simple highlight like that, it makes it a lot easier for people to interpret and, and, and make sense of. So conditional formatting is a great tool. It's also really good when you're just at the beginning process to, to lend your eye towards areas that, you, that may need more analysis. Um, and in general, Google Spreadsheets has come a long way in the last couple of years in terms of the charts that they have available. I know for a long time, I, would, I might play around with my data in, in, spread, in, in, uh, in Google Spreadsheets, but when I came down to graphing it, I'd almost always move it over to Excel because of the more powerful uh, tools that it has. And I'd say that in, Excel still wins that battle, but it's actually quite surprising at the power of, of uh, Google Spreadsheets for doing a lot of different kinds of graphing uh, uh, activities. And uh, there again, like we said earlier, the fact that it's web native means that you can, you can embed these things directly and they can, you can have, be embedding live data into websites and doing all kinds of fun stuff with a little technical know-how, but not as hard as you might think. Now, I think the coolest one that we ran into, this is a, something called a motion chart, which some of you may be familiar with. It allows you to take a number of different axes of data uh, and bring them all together by using time as one of them. So you can see at the bottom of the screen, we have a timeline that's set to 2002 right now. And uh, we have uh, a top uh, or a vertical axis of GDP, a horizontal axis of carbon uh, CO2 emissions, and the size of the bubbles is also another, uh, another axis. So you're getting a lot of different dimensions of data being presented at once, and it can, it can bring out some very interesting uh, uh, stories. Now, I'll talk, this is actually from the project that I worked on on the weekend, so I'll talk a little bit more about what, what we thought this data was trying to say in a little while. Okay. And uh, one more that I found uh, quite useful is what's called Google Fusion Tables. Google Fusion Tables is, is a little bit of an odd beast. It's one that I'm still starting to wrap my head around. Essentially, it's another approach to uh, using data that's set up like a spreadsheet. 
In this case, it has more, definitely much more strict rules about what kinds of data that you can put into it. But what it lets you do is it lets you literally bring data from different sources and bring them together and do interesting stuff with it. One of the most useful things that it has is it, is it has a, a, works with Google Maps to bring geographical data in. So I may have a table that lists, like this one does, the number of registered voters in various neighborhoods in Vancouver. And I also have a, a KML file, a, a geographic file, that lists these same neighborhoods. I can use Google Fusion tables with a little cleanup to fuse together, and now I can see that the, that the various regions are shaded based on the number of registered voters that each neighborhood has. And that's the kind of thing that people were able to do on our weekend in the, in, over the course of an hour or two rather than, you know, a whole, like, you know, multiple days. Um, it lets you do neat things. Like you, can put, you can put arbitrary uh, HTML in those bubbles. So if you want to make something that's, you know, puts the picture of Gregor Robertson in that bubble if, if, uh, if uh, he was the winner or something like that, it's, it's pretty trivial to do that kind of thing. Um, it also does a few other visualizations that we didn't get a chance to get into that look quite intriguing. You can do things like... Uh, uh, network graphs, which is something that would have come in really handy when I was doing some card sorting uh, information with usability testing uh, earlier this year. So I'm glad to know about these things. In fact, a lot of these tools, I kind of winced when I saw them because I realized how much time they would have saved me if I'd known about them even a few months earlier. So that's some of the visualization tools. Again, a very, very quick overview. Um, there's a lot more that we can go into, and, and I wish we had the time to actually open these tools up and step you through them. But if you do have more questions, we're more than happy to talk about them. Let's uh, talk about some of our projects that we worked on. So I'm just going to talk about the projects that I worked on with uh, my team. So for my project, I was fortunate to work with two other people. I'll give them credit here. Oliver Rolfs, who is a communications officer with the BC Government and Service Employees Union, and Stephen Williams, who has a background in corporate social responsibility for a software company. So we are all interested in bicycling, so we are attracted to the idea of working with Vancouver's bike count data. The city of Vancouver keeps track of bicycle trips along certain routes. And on these routes, there's uh, bike counters, which are just pneumatic hoses stringing across the, the pathway that register when bike wheels run over them. And it counts the number of bicycles that pass along that route in a 24-hour period. So here is a KML file. So that's a file type that uh, has geographic coordinates that can be used to um, place on a Google map and show you uh, in this case, the paths that are, um, have bike counter on them. So it's uh, Broad Street Bridge, Dunsmere Street, Dunsmere Viaduct, and Hornby Street. So we took uh, bicycle data from the city of Vancouver's website, and they start uh, July, f July 1st, 2009 for the Broad Bridge, and then the data the three other route statistics begin at later dates. And we also took daily weather data downloaded from Environment Canada's National Climate and Information Archive, and then combi compiled those two where we matched the, the dates so that you can have in one spreadsheet the number of bike counts going over during that day, as well as the um, temperature, average mean temperature, and the precipitation in millimeters for that day. And that's registered at the Vancouver airport, so it's not perfect, but we'll do. And so this is um, a, a chart that we produced to show patterns in ridership, temperature, and precipitation. So this is a screenshot of a, a motion chart. I'll show you the motion chart in a second. But the, the y-axis is the number of riders. And then this is for the Burrard Street Bridge. And the x-axis is the mean temperature. So it's also reflected in the color of each circle. So the cooler 
the circle, the, or the bluer the circle, the cooler the temperature, and the redder the circle, the warmer it was. So you can kind of see a, a, a gentle sloping of warm weather and uh, warm weather contributing to, or you know, who knows, warm weather and bikes, more bike, more bike rides uh, happening at the same time. So who would have thought? <laughs> and then this is the motion chart that you can make in Google Spreadsheets. Similar, so I have the data. If I just do insert chart and select a motion chart, and then the data is formatted uh, with a certain number of you know, attributes in certain columns. Easy, to, easy, to, easy enough to do. Um, so on the y-axis is the precipitation, and the riders are this time, riders per 24-hour period are on the x-axis. And the mean temperature is um, reflected in the color. And so I'll just play what a motion chart looks like in Google Spreadsheets. So you can see the is it rains, cycling dips. And then there's other data from Hornby Street or the other Dunsmuir Viaduct pathways. And it's raining a lot. <laughs> and as it heats up, you'll start to see more bike riders coming out or not. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's our project that we did with uh, Google Spreadsheets. I'll let, turn it over to Jonathan. All right. Let's get back to this. Sorry. It's all right. All right, so I would have the uh, privilege of working with Stephanie Hazlitt and Andy Toyker, uh, both of whom work in environmental reporting for the BC government. So they came over from Victoria. Um, they had a bunch of really interesting data sets to, that they had in mind. And so I was really happy to work with people who had not only the data sets, but also the knowledge to know how to interpret them. And I was there to sort of bring uh, any of the sort of technical skills that I could bring alongside them. Uh, so, um, we found this really neat uh, database from SFU uh, with a really awkward acronym. The uh, Canadian Industrial Energy End Use Data and Analysis Centre. Um, this is actually a really fantastic site and one that was not on any of our lists. It has uh, various uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, energy use type information broken down by industry along with uh, GDP. So you can see how uh, an industry compares with what it's, what, you know, one measure of how it's contributing to society versus the uh, greenhouse gases that it, that it produces. So we thought this would be an interesting to, thing to try to visualize. Um, it does have the ability to download things in PDF or in uh, Excel. So we do have a CSV file that we're able to open up in a spreadsheet um, but it's not the best formatted data ever. There's lots of empty space and it wasn't terribly usable for us in this, in this form. Um, we had to use a fair bit of elbow grease because that's one tool that we haven't mentioned so far. Sometimes it just does take work to get some of this data organized. But one thing we had, I kind of, it was actually kind of fun. The three of us sat together with the same, this same spreadsheet open up for all of us and used the collaborative abilities of Google Spreadsheets to Edit, edit it simultaneously and clean up this fairly large data set in, in short order. Um, so once we had a fairly clean data set, uh, we were able to have something that looks a little bit more like that. So here we have a unique value in each column, which in general, if you're working with data, um, this is called normalizing your data, something I've been reintroduced to in, in my database class recently. Um, if you can have, try to have a unique value, type of value in each column, it makes your graphing and your data manipulation much easier going down in the future. So you can see we have the name of the industry, 
We have the year at which we're recording the information. We have the, uh, the CO2 uh, uh, amount. We have the energy used by this particular industry, and we have the GDP. And then we have what's called the index, which in this case um, is the uh, CO2 divided by the GDP, which we were using to see if we could find some interesting patterns. Okay. So here's the first, the first graph that we managed to produce. Um, this just lets us uh, directly compare GDP versus CO2. And you can see a few standout ones that make a lot of sense. Energy generation produces a lot of CO2. And this just, I didn't say this, this is across Canada. We were originally looking for BC only data, but this was the best thing that we could come up with in the weekend that we had to work on this. Um, so as it makes sense, energy production is not necessarily a source of GDP, but it en enables other industries. So it would make sense that the CO2, the greenhouse gases produced, would far outweigh the uh, GDP. An uh, interesting one, of course, is that this, this big red spike, that's construction. Again, there's a large, in a large uh, con contribution to GDP and a fairly low uh, amount of CO2 produced relative to that. Here is again where I talked about the index. Um, so we took, uh, we took CO2, divided it by the GDP, and then we graphed it over a number of years to see how they change. And you can see that we have um, two ones up high. The petroleum product manufacturing and electricity generation are kind of winning, winning that battle. So basically, they're producing the most CO2 per amount of GDP uh, that we have. I'm sorry I'm not using very good units here. I'm, I didn't actually write them down. And I'm not, I was like this at the tech guy, not the interpreting of data guy. So. <laughs> Um, I'm sure they'd be far more informative about that kind of stuff than I am. And, oh, and lastly, I wanted to actually show you the, that's not the one I wanted. Where are you? There we go. So I'll show you the chart that we produced. So, what I'll do is I'll set this up in a way that I think was useful. So we put CO2 on the vertical axis. Or sorry, we put a, we'll, put, we'll put a GDP on the vertical axis. We have CO2 on the horizontal axis. We put uh, the color just to be unique colors so that you can tell the different bubbles apart. And we made the size, the energy used by the, by the various industries. So interestingly enough, electricity uses the most energy of any of them. Um, and now uh, we can play it through from 1990 up to 2010 and see how things change. And I found this quite interesting. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't provide a lot. You can see that there are certain ones that have horizontal movement, other ones that have more vertical movement. And you can see when we hit 2008, you'll see everything kind of contracts a little bit. Boom. Which is an interesting little side effect that both the um, GDP reduced and the actual CO2 emissions reduced as well. Um, yeah, so this is a tool that we found quite interesting in terms of looking at uh, a way to analyze your data and bring it all together into one spot and see multiple axes at the same time. And one that looks really nice when you're doing a presentation like this. So, to wrap things up, we're working on this wiki page, which I, I put together. It's on, the, it's on the library wiki, and right now it's, uh, it's set up for I internal use. I thought, we thought we'd put our money where our mouth is and actually put it on the wiki rather than on the, the internal wiki. Although, um, and I hope that if this, uh, this source gets fleshed out, it may be something that we actually do want to make, make available to students as well. Um, yeah, so we're, yeah, like I said, we're going to be adding more to this over the next few days. And I really encourage you, if you, if you find the resource helpful, um, add to it. If you find anything else that you'd like to, like to add. And that really kind of wraps it up for our, our presentation. Um, we'd love if you have any questions or things uh, to ask us. Uh, we're, we're happy to help. So thank you very much.
Any questions or is it all a blur? Yes. Uh, my name is Eugene Barsky, I'm an engineering librarian. Uh, not a question, but a remark. Uh, if you guys, if anybody is interested in data management, that's the hottest area that science and engineering libraries right now. In fact, it's really hard to find incoming librarians with the skills. Uh, lots, lots of libraries in Canada try, and in fact, we cannot recruit anybody because people just don't have the skills. So if you're looking for a place to go, that's the place. Okay, thank you. Yes? Um, I'm often looking for data sets to do some cool stories or whatever. I find that a lot of the Vancouver ones, like the one uh, the Fusion table you showed earlier, stop at the endowment lines. Uh, do you know yeah. where you can find, um, like where UBC might have open data that can apply to UBC? That's a, that's a really good question. It's one that I ran into as well. Um, I definitely found that when you're a student here, you have access to a lot, have easy access to a lot more data than people sort of on the outside have. So, um, I mean, I definitely think that going to uh, data librarians and like when I had that, that uh, information or that problem, I went to Tom Brittnacker and, and uh, he helped me find a lot of uh, more detailed data sets and things through StatsCan and that kind of thing. But I don't know of anything, maybe there are people here or elsewhere on campus that would know more about UBC campus specific data that we could sort of fuse into the city data as well. That's a good question. Yes? Do you have uh, do you lists, uh, you referred to your lists of these sources um, of data, and are those on the wiki as well, or is it primarily the tools that you used? Some of the, some of the tools there are a number of data, open data catalogs, and uh, Quora, the question and answer site, has a, you know, a question, where can I find public data? And it's got a huge list of uh, websites with open data. So those are all included on the wiki, as well as um, Canadian local um, BC uh, regional, and then some national ones as well and some global. But yeah, it would be great to add more if you find them or, or have them. Tell us about the CBC data. There's a website called PL. It's a planning and instructional research. Well, most of the UBC data, recruitment, the common students and the forestry, this kind of stuff will be on that side. OK, well. Thanks so much for coming out, and uh, we'll be around for a little while if you, if you want to ask us any questions. So thanks a lot. Thanks.